Well, thank you for joining us for the 2017 State of the University Address produced by students of the Brian Lamb School of Communication and Fast Track Live. My name is Trevor Peters and I am a senior in the Brian Lamb School and of course joining us is President Daniels here today. Now during topics to this discussion, we're going to be focusing on specifics in the open letter that he released uh, back in January of this month and how it relates to the university and to our students. So President Daniels, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. All right. So first thing we want to talk about is how you open the letter. So academic integrity, academic excellence, um, and academic rigor. So um, over the past several decades, Purdue has been able to um, keep its rigorous, rigorous cu curriculum, but also at the same time um, GPAs and, and being competitive with other universities and how we can put, set our students up to be uh, as successful as possible. Mm -hmm. And now academic rigor is a certain, it's a definition that's hard to pinpoint and it's specific to each university. So in discussions with University Senate and University faculty, um, what are we thinking when we think of academic rigor? How can we make sure that students aren't suffering from a world-class education but are still being challenged at the same time? Yeah, these are great. These are the right questions mm -hmm. and I've tried to present them as questions. I've got a viewpoint, but there may be others. Um, my viewpoint is that uh, at Purdue uh, apparently, and I think provably, is uh, a little tougher school than, than most. Uh, there's a decades long, as you pointed out, uh, record of average GPAs being somewhat lower here. Uh, and when you adjust this for the quality, the apparent quality of the entering class and so forth, it's, it's a clear pattern. And um, in my view, this is a plus now. Maybe in a way it hasn't always historically been because there are so many places where grade inflation, as it's called, has lifted the average GPA just through the skylight that uh, people are beginning to question the value of those degrees. They can't tell who the best prepared students are when everybody walks mm -hmm. out with, a, with an A. So, uh, but but I, I think these are things we all, uh, faculty, students, and, and, and those of us who work here should talk about. I've posed three questions, for instance, to the University Senate do we believe that we are a, a more rigorous place? Uh, do, are, do, are these data telling us what we think they are telling us? If so, is that a good thing? Um, uh, and I happen to think it is. Uh, I think employers believe it is, but you know, it's an open question. And if the answer to those two is yes, then what are we going to do to make sure we stay that way? But I just believe that it's no, that it's admirable, but it's also advantageous to Purdue students to attend a place where you have to study a little harder than other places and uh, where the world knows that if you emerge from here with a solid average, you earned it. So then along with those lines of academic excellence and rigor comes the question of integrity, mm -hmm. staying true to yourself, staying true to your degree into this university. Um, so several student organizations and, and faculty folks are working on uh, combating this. What is causing students to stray off the path and, path and how can we as mm -hmm. students hold each other accountable? I think these are such important questions. First, let's, let's acknowledge that just as in the case of rigor, we're dealing with a national phenomenon mm -hmm. here. It's been measured a dozen different ways and whatever's driving it, it's clear that, that the levels of cheating are up. Now, there's some, um, I think, pretty good, pretty obvious explanations for it. Um, there are uh, cultures where the concept of plagiarism as we know it here is, uh, uh, is not familiar. And so, to some extent, these, there may just be cultural differences with some of our international students. Uh, but it's, the, the problem's broader than that. The, the people that, are, that we find violating rules of integrity are coming all uh, from all backgrounds and so uh, I'm just really grateful that student leadership our student government and other groups the faculty has taken it seriously again it goes back to protecting the integrity of a mm -hmm. Purdue degree and there's a real fairness question here um, uh, which uh, is of course that uh, the student who uh, does his or her own work and who uh, uh, observes all the rules uh, uh, of, uh, of integrity uh, is uh, uh, shorted and cheated by the person in the next seat who didn't. And so uh, uh, there's a right and wrong reason that we want to deal with it. 
but, a, but a, in large measure it also goes back to this question of the value of Purdue degree which we think is extraordinarily high and we want to keep it that way. Absolutely. And so with that academic excellence, um, transitioning into the next part mm -hmm. of your letter, you talked about on-campus living mm -hmm. and how students that live in the residence halls have on average one point, one and a half points higher in the, uh, higher GPA mm -hmm. than students who live off campus. So um, what do you feel are the factors that students living in university residences um, are getting uh, that students that are living off campus are not? Yeah, interesting. Um, I think your common sense would tell you that, because uh, uh, we know this is not a new phenomenon, common sense would tell you that it's always been a little bit of an advantage to be uh, closer in, in the company of other students. Uh, maybe good examples rub off or you can get a little uh, help if you're stuck on something that's harder to do if you're off in an apart a distant apartment. Yeah. In more recent times though, this may be even more, we hope it is even more pronounced because we've been adding things to the residential experience. It's not just a matter of getting people getting students to live closer. Um, uh, we, tr we try to, as they say here, academicize uh, the residence, residences of today. That means things like, uh, uh, you know, more study areas, uh, areas for project teams to work together, sometimes faculty living in or close by, uh, programming. Uh, uh, oh, I, I should have started with probably um, our, our proliferating uh, learning communities mm -hmm. where there's programming and, and not only are you living next to people who are struggling with the same subjects you are but we have some extra assistance available so um, in today's era we, there may be two uh, reasons that we get these better results but uh, whatever's producing them uh, we, we think it's uh, the university's job to try to make it more uh, uh, convenient and, af and affordable for students to opt for that uh, in, in close living. So we just wrapped up the Honors College uh, mm -hmm. residence and just the immense amount of uh, ad advantage that that's provided for our Honors students mm -hmm. and we seem to get the state of the art um, places we continue to expand and continue to build. Um, what's next for Purdue on, on that sense? Yeah. Uh, well there's a lot going on is, as you might have heard and read and it's not all being done on the university's uh, a dollar in fact uh, the new innovation place apartments mm -hmm. that we're planning will be done with a private partner not on uh, it'll be on their nickel not mm -hmm. on the uh, the uh, universities and uh, meanwhile there are some uh, independent developments going up on Chauncey or hoping to go up on Chauncey and other places so some of the new in fact maybe much of the new uh, residential option will um, will just come from the marketplace meeting what it perceives is the interest and demand of Purdue students but we also are looking out beyond that and uh, we don't have any final decisions yet but uh, we've got some older buildings that we we'll either have to modernize or replace and there are a couple very interesting concepts about residences that might have a theme to them in a way like the Honors College mm -hmm. does but uh, it's exciting to me to, to, to look at maps and imagine a Purdue just a few years from now, which is, has even more life and vibrancy close to its core. And, and with this uh, proven positive that the students living there are likely to uh, do a little better. Yeah. So you mentioned the Innovation District and how um, that's going to not cost the university a whole lot, but it right. will um, advance the community. What, what specifically is it going to do to help the student experience, um, especially as this State Street project and this universe, as the gateway to Purdue is starting to go through yeah. this expansion, how is this uh, innovation district going to be something brand new? Only time will tell mm -hmm. because uh, uh, planners and all the rest of us amateurs can have uh, our ideas and, and uh, the dreams about what might go there, but ultimately the market will tell us. Um, what we think it, can't, it could well tell us is that there's a real interest in, uh, in faculty, maybe especially young faculty, but we'll see, obviously grad students, um, but also possibly just our neighbors um, who would like to live uh, close to the campus. Mm -hmm. In a, in a place that evolves with lots of retail and entertainment options that aren't there today, 
and just a general atmosphere or environment that's really attractive. As, as we, we continue to emphasize, um, we, we want to have, as if you'll permit me to say it, the coolest possible environment here at Purdue that we can possibly build that attracts students of the future, that attracts great faculty that we need to be more excellent. And we think the whole State Street Innovation District plays straight into that. Now, I continue to say that the, that the, the biggest piece of this puzzle will be our success that we hope we have attracting new businesses to the aerospace district mm -hmm. that's just beyond this uh, area we're discussing. And uh, if we can do that, uh, first, it uh, obviously it makes the finances of the whole project work, but better still, it would bring new people who might choose to live, work, play, shop in this evolving uh, district on our campus's edge. And uh, if all that comes together, the Purdue of five to ten years from now, I think, could be a really exciting place. Absolutely. So, into the next portion of your uh, your letter, we talked about academic, uh, or, a, or excuse me, athletic department uh -huh. investments. Um, and, I mean, investing in the athletic department, talking about bringing, attracting students to uh, Purdue mm -hmm. um, is, is a real hot topic. So, um, can you explain uh, kind of the hiring process of um, the new athletic director, um, athletic director Mike Babinski and, and Coach Brom, and how m much um, say academia had in it as opposed to in your relationship with the athletic department uh, along those same lines? Well, they were both very, I think, thorough searches. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a whole industry uh, out there that, uh, that works on this. We, in fact, we did engage professional help, which we don't always do, but these were important, uh, uh, and I, I think the professional help was valuable. They can gather both objective and subjective information about candidates that's pretty deep and that we might not have found on our own. I've, I've joked a time or two that I wish I thought we could gather as much information about a new dean, let's say, as you can find out about a football coach, yeah. because it's pretty thorough. <laughs> but um, uh, in the in the case of uh, of the uh, we, we had a search committee in the case of the athletic department, but we also uh, or the athletic director, but we also left open the possibility of a of a parallel track, knowing that there were some candidates out there who just couldn't go through an open process. They already had jobs and so forth. And that we might cut ourselves off some from, real, from some real talent if we did that. And so in the case of Mike Babinski, it was really the chairman of the board and I who uh, saw him uh, as a, uh, uh, quickly decided he was a top uh, target candidate. At the end of the process, we introduced him to the search committee so that they could make their own judgment. Mm -hmm. But he came down a parallel track, and we probably wouldn't have gotten him if we uh, had not had that second channel open. And uh, in the case of Jeff Brom, um, um, all I can tell you is that uh, whether it's ESPN or CBS Sports yeah. or anybody who looked at, at all the hires of this uh, postseason yep. said Purdue got the best one. guy out there, and uh, everything that we've seen of Jeff since he, uh, since he arrived uh, validates that. So a lot of changes going on, a lot of great changes, exciting for us students mm -hmm. at least. Um, new uh, physical or football facility as well. How long do you think it'll take before we see the community, the West Lafayette community, the Purdue community um, truly being transformed and maybe going back to how we were back in the early 2000s from these big changes that we've uh, we're You're talking about right athletics now. Now. Athletics, yes. Yeah. Well, a couple of, let me give you a couple of, of answers. As I've said many, many times over the last year or two, Purdue doesn't have an athletic problem. We had a football problem. We had a one sport problem. I mean, there, there are, you always want to get better at other things right. or other sports, but, uh, um, and, but uh, uh, look at men's basketball right now, yeah. what they're doing for us. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I, I have every confidence, but who knows, I mean, that uh, uh, we'll see uh, some improvement, maybe fairly swift improvement, we'll see in football. But uh, answering your question directly, I think the community's already energized. We haven't played one game in the new era. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows it's not going to happen overnight. Right. But, the, uh, but uh, at the, re, uh, at the uh, signing day, mm -hmm. recruiting lunch, 
1,100 people showed up. It was three or four X what it's been in the past. So that tells you right there that people are uh, excited and, and optimistic, and I hope, we'll start, I hope that'll be reflected in attendance and everything else uh, as the new era gets started. Now, one last point, and this is not a Purdue issue. This is an everywhere issue also. I think we've got, there's some big questions around spectator sports. You say, well, be like it used to be. Um, let's hope. But you know, we've got to do a better job than we're doing now in getting students interested yep. in all our sports. If they're not interested now as students, there's a chance they won't be interested as graduates and alums. And so uh, there are a lot of distractions, a lot of options that didn't used to be there, entertainment options that uh, you and your uh, counterparts uh, can choose from. Yep. And so uh, having, having great coaches and good facilities isn't going to be enough. We have to try to stay uh, up with the trends in terms of making these events uh, attractive and lively and worth, worth coming to. Because mm -hmm. we're competing with somebody's you know, four-foot high-def TV <laughs> yeah. in, the, in a very comfortable uh, you know, living room somewhere yeah. these days, and uh, not to mention other entertainment choices. So. Uh, long answer, but I, I do think we're making the, the right moves. You mentioned the Performance Center, which mm -hmm. all the information we had said, want to get Purdue back to elite status in football. This was the missing element. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to open this year. If that leads to, plus a great new coach leads to uh, the recruitment of, of uh, ever better talent, uh, I'm pretty sure the winds will follow. There's absolutely some exciting stuff going mm -hmm. on. Um, so now into declining costs of, of attendance. So other universities are failing and Purdue is not. And mm -hmm. it's cheaper now to go to Purdue than in the fall of 2012. So how are you able to maintain this uh, frozen tuition while other universities continue to, to fail but Purdue is succeeding? I think we just prioritize it. Mm -hmm. And we say that, um, that uh, access for students of all income and backgrounds is really important to us here at Purdue, and then student success mm -hmm. uh, while you're here. And we're trying to concentrate our resources on those things. Um, I just don't, I don't feel we've done uh, nearly what we ought to eventually in terms of, of moving resources from less essential things to the most important objectives. But so far it's been enough to do this. And if you set that as your uh, uh, number one goal, and try to make other things accommodate to it. It turns out it wasn't that, that hard to do. But uh, it, it won't go on forever. I, the letter that I wrote stresses, lest anybody suspect the contrary, Purdue's balance sheet is stronger now than when Free started. It's not as though we've been drawing down uh, reserves or resources, mm -hmm. quite the opposite. And uh, it's not because we're doing it on the cheap. Across higher ed generally, the average percentage of faculty who are tenured is fallen below 30 percent. It's above 70 percent here. So it's not as though you and your fellow students are being taught by you know, all adjuncts and, uh, and, and, and uh, less than, than uh, the best uh, professors we can find. So we'll never let that happen. But as long as we can have high quality instruction uh, and uh, and, and keep the uh, cost as affordable as possible, that's going to be our policy. Absolutely. So then um, with, I mean, being able to kind of see other universities around us in the recent uh, St. Joseph's College um, mm -hmm. situation, what role should universities such as Purdue play um, in a situation like that where we want to help those students out? Yeah. Um, and we've done that by a lot, waiving tuition or waiving the admissions fee um, do we think we did the right thing, um, or should we have done something better? Clearly, this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said to their president, he sent up an SO, out an SOS, more or less, a couple days before all the news broke. Mm -hmm. And I said, I hope we never have to help. Yeah. But, if, but if it comes to that, we want to be as helpful as any school can be. And, uh, uh, you know, um, one thing I think we have to work on, in, uh, uh, another thing in general here is we're a little bit bureaucratic and stodgy about transfers. Mm -hmm. 
and the different colleges have different rules and what will we give credit for and so forth. And I'm not saying those things are unimportant, but we've been looking at that anyway. There's some really, there's some students who have already proven they can do college level work somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you're not just going on an SAT score or mm -hmm. you know, what they did in, in some high school. And yet we, uh, it's sometimes too difficult for them to, to transfer. So you see something like the St. Joseph's situation come around. Um, we'll lean as far forward as we can to help any students there who might want to come here. And maybe in the process we can uh, teach ourselves that, uh, that um, we, sh we should keep the door of Purdue a little more open than it's been to mm -hmm. people coming in midstream. So final question, uh, we just want to uh, end it today by asking you, it's your fifth year here, um, sitting in your office, are you content with um, the state of the university currently and everything that has happened here in five years? What have, you, what have been the great things that we've been able to achieve and what are things that we can do to improve? No, I'm not content <laughs> and you shouldn't want me to be content. <laughs> uh, it, it, do, I, do I believe that uh, Purdue is a fantastic place and that uh, that, we've, that we're having some pretty uh, uh, good progress and strong days. Yeah, I do, but we're, we're never gonna be content. We're not nearly the school we could be and wanna be. And so uh, um, we'll, we'll continue to be open to new ideas and try to think of a few ourselves mm -hmm. that will take us further upward. There are plenty of places where we need to be stronger. We're, world-class in certain disciplines and, and not distinguished in, in others, and so we'll be working on those things. Um, the, uh, uh, always, the, we've talked in this terrific interview about various ways, and rigor and integrity and so forth, that we, uh, where we know we would like to improve further, all aimed at the end, ultimate goal, of making the value of a Purdue degree as high as any anywhere. And uh, so uh, I love being here. I think we are, as a university, one of the strongest around, but you can always be a lot better. So uh, heck no, we're not content. And if we ever start acting that way, we're gonna count on you and, <laughs> and your fellow student journalists to come around and yep. uh, snap us out of it. Great, thank you so much. This has Enjoyed been an incredible yeah. interview and we uh, look forward to uh, future interviews and uh, the year to come. Come Thanks anytime. So much. Thank you.